four. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, pray before we read this. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words. I do pray that you'd help us to be people that uh, do not ignore uh, the spiritual world, do not ignore uh, the things that are around us. Help us to be people that are at least uh, observant of things invisible. Help us to be faithful to that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Luke chapter 4, there's a, there's, this is a, a chapter that has so much information that a person could spend an entire month <clears throat> just preaching uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and a Thursday night just from this chapter. I mean, the first 13 verses you can see deal with the temptations of Christ. So a person can talk about the three basic temptations. In verse 4, the last six words are removed from the New Bibles, but by every word of God. In verse 8, get thee behind me, Satan, is removed from the New Bible. So that one can be a topic of discussion. In verse 10 and 11, you have Satan quoting the Bible. So there's an example of a satanic translation. That's in that chapter. You can spend time with that one. Uh, In verse 5, about Satan uh, revealing all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. You're dealing with telecommunications. You're dealing with... um, you know, something about the earth, as far as being able to see that, uh, that's done at a, at a moment of time. So you can hit on the idea of uh, scientific information there, telecommunications. You can hit on the idea of the temptation where Satan said, if you bow and worship me, I'll give you all the world kingdoms. And you can hit on the idea of the powers behind religion and politics. I mean, that's a whole sermon in itself. When you get down to Jesus reading a Bible in his home country, in his home area, you'll see what portion of the Bible he read, and then he stopped at a specific place. And you could teach on rightly dividing the word of truth, where Jesus Christ gave the pattern. Okay, he, Jesus didn't believe all the Bible applied to everybody in every age. Okay, we are to believe it. Uh, you can see that he is a gracious words in verse 22, but when he uttered this truth, uh, somebody got so mad, those people got so angry that they wanted to throw him over a cliff. Truth and grace. You can see that he warned Israel about rejecting God in verse 24, 25, 26. You can see that he prophesied about Gentiles um, coming to God, the power of God. I mean, there's so much in there, but I'm going to pick it up after uh, these people wanted to throw him over a cliff in verse 29 and then see what is going on behind the scenes in the invisible world. Uh, I'm amazed that uh, Christians or the church itself really doesn't even consider the invisible world, the spiritual warfare. If you talk to Uh, Baptist preachers about spiritual warfare, they have not a clue what you're talking about. Just oblivious to it. Where Paul said, we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. And the church doesn't even discuss it. Hollywood does. Hollywood discusses it. But the church doesn't. And if the church does, they say, oh, you're just paranoid. No, I think people in Florida have a right to be paranoid right now. Okay, but still, uh, the natural man doesn't like to consider the spirit world. The natural man is busy trying to fulfill self-gratification, self-preservation, and self-propagation. That's about what he's doing all the time. Uh, Once in a while, they'll stumble across the paranormal, okay, the spirit world, but then that will often breed paranoia. I just paranoid. And... The idea this morning is to be prepared spiritually, but not paranoid, okay? And so this is a common thing in the ministry of the Lord Jesus. When you read uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see over and over and over about unclean spirits manifesting themselves. But have you ever seen that? Or do you recognize it? Do you know when it manifests itself? The church don't know anything about it. The Lord knew something about it. He didn't glorify it. He wasn't paranoid about it. He was just matter of fact. 
And that's the power of God. In Luke 4, verse 30, But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way, came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. Well, what's that guy doing in, in a synagogue? You would think that that guy wouldn't show up in a synagogue. You would think that guy would be over there playing a Ouija board or, you know, reading the palm readers or, you know, uh, in, the, in the bar or, you know, sacrificing somebody. What's he doing in a synagogue? In our day, what's he doing in church? But that's where you'll see a lot of this stuff manifested if you know what you're looking for. Okay, so it's kind of strange that this guy would show up to hear Jesus Christ preach. You would tend to think he would want to get away from him. But here he is right there. A man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. Unclean devil, that's like a man, you know, repetitive there, like wet water. Okay, so it's an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice. He just interrupted. He just yelled and screamed during a public service. Now, I've seen him get nervous as a cat room full of rocking chair, sitting in the back and be nervous, walk back and forth and get up and walk out and come back in. I've seen that. Okay, but this, this person with this devil, okay, and then he openly says out, uh, out loud, let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Okay, so who's the us? Well, you could say the devil and the man. But if you go to Mark chapter 5, there are times when a spirit is 2,000 devils. Where the legion said, we are, we are many. So it's kind of a schizophrenic type situation. Bipolar, tripolar, quadruple polar, 1,000 polar. Okay, and... He, said, he says, let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Well, I know you got a lot to do with him. You are infatuated with him. You're trying to do everything you can to hinder his work. That's what you're doing. And you've got um, a host there that you are a parasite off of. And as soon as you dump the host, or if he dies, as soon as you do, do that, you're going to merrily go find another host. And then he says this, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Wow. He's a, he's a fundamentalist. He believes in the holiness of God, the number one attribute. He's smarter than Christians are. You ask the average Christian what the most important attribute of God is today, they'll say love. They don't even know, they know less than the devils know. They know you're holy. And they're not atheists. You're the Holy One of God. That's quite a testimony. But Jesus did not want their testimony. Verse 5, Jesus rebuked him saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. Get out of here, pal. Just matter of fact, no drama. No bringing up on the platform to make a big deal about it. Nobody yelling and screaming as far as, you know, everybody working this thing up. No uh, Roman Catholic priest with his little crucifix, you know, saying over and over for an hour, hour and a half, and floating in the air trying to get this done. It's just a matter of fact with God. Matter of fact, he just says, nicely, shut up and get out of here. Okay, hold thy peace and come out of him. I mean, this is common in the ministry of Jesus Christ, but Christians ignore it as best they can. It says, And when a devil had thrown him in the midst and came out of him and heard him not, the typical reaction, they were all amazed, spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this, for with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. What do you expect? He's God of the universe. No, no big deal here. People think that God and the devil is like a struggle. It's no more than a struggle where there's a fly there, and I kind of get my hand real close to it, real close, real close, and then I go. That's the finger of God. That's what Jesus described in Luke 11. By the finger of God, he casts out devils. Or if you can grab it like that, 
you know, and then get it and pull its wings off and then set it down there and watch it walk back and forth. And then Mrs. Fly is wondering where he was that night when you don't come home. Well, he's got to walk home. Can't fly south. He's got to walk home. <laughs> okay, but uh, with God, there's no, there's no problem here. And with a believer in Christ who knows uh, these things, there's no problem. There's no big deal. It's not a paranoia or anything. Okay, and then, he, and then notice the reaction after this. And he rose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with great fever. And they besought him for her. So this is the first vicar of Christ, the first pope, and he got married. None of them obey that. And she had a fever. Okay, just a typical, you know, common flu. Probably didn't get her flu shot. Or maybe she did get a flu shot and got the fever. That's what happened to me both times. I got the flu shot, got the fever. I said, forget it. I ain't taking the flu shot ever again. Okay, and so she got a fever. And he stood over her, verse 39, and rebuked the fever. And it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. So just common order. You don't see that on TV. You don't see that in the Christian world. You don't see that with Pentecostals and Charismatics. So just a few hours later, now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him. You talk about word spreading. Okay, you know, everybody got on their cell phones and texted it everywhere. They got everybody to come. So here they're all coming. Okay, he laid his hands on every one of them and and he and healed them. No duds, no show, no flash, just matter of fact. Boom, here's what it is. And he didn't have to take 20 or 30 minutes like we do with Morris because we have our limitations. And when these diseases left, many of these people, verse 41, and, the, and devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. Well, look at there. They believe in the Messiah. They believe in the deity of Christ. They believe he's the Son of God. Wow, that's quite a statement. They're not out doing playing a Ouija. They're not out doing seances. There they are, right by Jesus Christ. And some of uh, people's sicknesses are a result of devils because you reap what you sow. Not saying like the Christian scientists that say, you know, you're all, you know, it's all the devil. Verse 42, and when it was day, so he did this all night long. He departed, went into a desert place, and the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also for therefore am I sent and he preached in the synagogues of Galilee and no doubt this went on over there too all over the place and so really this morning the only idea I want to get across to you that we need to be prepared spiritually but not paranoid okay a person can get paranoid but we need to be prepared spiritually the beings of the spirit world often manifested themselves around the Lord Jesus But when it came across his path, it was just a very simple matter of fact, and he dealt with it right on the spot and then just moved on. The supernatural world is normal to God as the natural world because he sees both worlds. You and I don't see both worlds. So it's rather unusual when we see something from the invisible world manifesting itself in the visible world, and that's a shocker to people, but yet... Believing what the Bible says, it should be something that's a forefront in our mind. The argument with the person on your job may not be personality conflicts. It may be a devil that's just in there just trying to stir up trouble. The problems in a home may not be just somebody's misunderstanding somebody. Maybe it's a devil or a spirit that's just trying to stir up some ruckus and if a person doesn't know what to do and here there's a big fight going on and the little imps in the corner are getting a big kick out of it oh it makes them happy it makes their day the bible reveals unseen forces greatly influence natural man now hollywood knows it they know it 
Why don't the church know? Why doesn't church consider it? All I'm saying is we just need to consider it, and then what can we do about it? So the first thought I want to give you about this is about the unseen is we need to be prepared without being paranoid. Okay, I'm not saying that we need to look for a devil under, you know, under everything, look under the pew, and blame him for everything because you know, people say the devil made me do it. No, don't count on that. He's, he's too busy translating new Bibles, revising. That's his number one thing. Okay, that's the first thing he did in Genesis 3. He messed with the Word of God. So he's busy getting out another version coming out. You know, and that's, that's his focus. His focus is governmental things, international. So that's his focus. He can only be in one place at one time. But his little buddies, they do a lot of things. And a person needs to be prepared. Many people who prepare for disastrous, disastrous society, this society often are overcome with fear. Okay, this is called a spirit of fear. So a person can prepare but yet not be paranoid. You know, economic collapse. It can happen anytime God wants it to happen or allows it. When you've got a fiat currency, anytime God says, okay, it's going to happen, the Illuminati can pretend to have it done at a certain time, but nah. Uh, our governing structures have a program up in Alaska called HARP. They, they bounce the uh, atmosphere with electronic waves, thinking that they can create certain uh, natural catastrophes, moving hurricanes. Maybe they can do that, but I can kind of imagine God in heaven allowing them, thinking they're doing that, but God's doing it. And then in a tribulation, when they try to move all the electrical stuff, God says, nah, forget that, get away. And he's just going to take care of it. But uh, the Illuminati, shadow, dark government, okay, yeah, so what? They're doing stuff. God's over them. You see, a person can be prepared. There's a whole religion out in Utah, the Mormons. They teach their people they need to prepare for you know turmoil. So they have they have food. They've got water stored up. All of them got it all stored. They need to because they're hitting the tribulation time period. You see, so they're prepared. You see, now, a person can prepare and not be paranoid. And now, there's a lot of funny sayings. You get online about paranoia, and it's funny. Okay? If you're not paranoid, you just don't know the facts. That's what a lot of folks say. Another one is, it's strange how paranoia can link up with reality every now and then. And that's true. Every once in a while. Paranoia is just having the right information. Okay, one guy said, anyone not paranoid in this world must be crazy. Speaking of paranoia, it's true that I don't know exactly who my enemies are, but of course, it is exactly why I'm paranoid. <laughs> Another one guy said, don't be a little paranoid. Worry about everything. Or just let it go. That's one way of acting with it. Another one is, uh, you've already lost... Okay, if you're paranoid about something, if you have already lost, if you are always fear, fearful of losing everything, you've already lost it. In your mind, you're not enjoying it. Another one is uh, a, a writer, a writer of novels said, you can't write novels without a touch of paranoia. I'm paranoid as an act of good citizenship, concerned about what the powerful people are up to. Well, I know what they're up to. They're up to no good. And that's the way it is. One guy says, please, don't continually say I'm paranoid. Why? It makes me paranoid. Another one says, was it still paranoia if all his fears were justified? It's like a guy that the, the joke goes, this guy was always sick, always with a doctor. Doctor can never figure anything out. And then a guy up and dies. And on a, cemetery, on a tombstone it says, now do you believe me I was sick? But you see, you can't cure imaginary sickness. A person can think themselves into it. This one lady writes, she says, Never let your fear of the unknown and things being too difficult make your choices for you in life. One of the saddest lessons in life is finding out that your fear 
made the situation worse than it was. And a braver person stole the dream you gave up on. There's a lot of truth in that one. The idea of being paranoid. Paranoia. The more you think of an imaginary problem, the more you feel as though it is real. So I'm not promoting being paranoid. I'm promoting being prepared, knowing what to do. Paranoia has a side effect. One guy says, paranoid? Probably. But just because you're paranoid doesn't mean there isn't an invisible demon about to eat your face. And there's some truth in that. Okay, here's one for the psychology world. This lady, Shannon, writes this. She says, the more you talk about it, rehash it, rethink it, cross it and analyze it, debate it, respond to it, get paranoid about it, compete with it, complain about it, immortalize it, cry over it, kick it, defame it, stalk it, gossip about it, pray over it, put it down or dissect its motives, it continues to rot in your brain. She said, it is dead, it is over, it's gone, it's done, it's time to bury it because it is smelling up your life and nobody, no one wants to be near your rotted corpse of memories and decaying attitude. Be the funeral director of your life and bury that thing. And that's about past memories. And there's a lot of truth in that. A lot of truth in that. So, I believe we ought to be prepared, know what to do, but not paranoid. Now, Hollywood. People say, well, you believe in devils and ghosts and all this spirit stuff. You know, that's just because, you know, you're superstitious and, you know, you're not dealing with reality. You're not dealing with science. Okay, let's try Hollywood. Let's see what Hollywood says. They glamorize the paranormal, paranormal for deceptive purposes. Because John chapter 10 says that the devil has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Do people know what's called method acting in Hollywood? Method acting is when an actor or actress attempts to become the character during the entire time of filming. They're not pretending they're becoming the character. It's called method acting. Nicholas Cage calls this new shaman. He uh, was the actor in a movie called Ghost Rider, which I don't know anything about. Okay, but... Uh, he says that he invited demonic spirits to enter into him to help him become the character. He took e Egyptian icons into his costume. He didn't talk to anybody on the set. He just would go to the set and then act this thing out, and people were deathly afraid of him. He admits selling his soul to Satan, if you're open-minded. He relied upon the outside to empower the inside. And he said that Ghost Rider is more real than you think it is. The spiritual and the material is combined. Now, he's doing it for fame and fortune. And when the devil wants to get up, give up his body, they will merrily go find another sucker. Okay, Heath Ledger played the Joker, was so possessed with devils that he took his life before the movie even came out. Heath Ledger spent almost an entire month locked up in a motel room writing a diary as if he were the Joker. He told a New York Times interviewer that he had difficulty sleeping and probably averaged two hours of sleep in the final week. He died shortly thereafter. And upon his death, Shirley MacLaine has admitted that she has channeled time and time again for her acting as well as Jack Nicholson. And Jack Nicholson displayed two separate, two voices at the same time while Shirley MacLaine was the actress. And upon Heath Ledger's death, when Nicholson was told about Heath Ledger's death, he said, I warned him. Because these people think that they're using devils to help them, but the devils are using them to wipe them out when they're ready. You see, this is not... It's amazing to me that Christians know nothing, very little about this, but Hollywood knows everything about it. Robin Williams, before he died, you can look into his eyes. And in fact, about two months before he died, I think I said from the pulpit, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this guy kicks off here shortly. You could see it in his eyes. He admitted possession 
when he was acting and comedy. You mean the devils get you to laugh? Exactly. Oprah admits she channels. Denzel Washington admits that he communicates spirits before acting on the set. You see, now, when all these people die, their unclean spirits will de depart their dead body and will merely go find another individual to inhabit. But it's amazing to me how the spirit world is totally overlooked and ignored by believers. And unbelievers rely upon this unseen force for power. And so my thought this morning to you is that we ought not ignore it. We ought not glamorize it. We ought not be paranoid about it. We need to just matter-of-factly read our Bible and discover God's got all the answers. And Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 20 is the spiritual armor that believers need to put on. It's called the armor of God. How do you do that? You do it subconsciously. You do it by spoken word or you pray it on. Lord, please put on my helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, put on my gird, my loins with thy truth. Okay, and the more you're around this stuff, the more we need our armor, armor on to protect us so we can stand against the wiles of the devil. We're standing against these things. You see, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but most arguments that people are having are between flesh and blood, and we don't consider the unseen force that's caused the argument. Okay, and I'm not saying we push everything off the devil. We have a responsibility in this. Okay, and when we open this door to these forces, then the devil can take those who are captive at his will. He's the one who has the choice in the matter. This is why some people like George Burns, can live over to be 100 years old as a wicked man. It's because it's the choice of the devil. And then people like Heath Ledger kicks off in his 30s. When, God's, when the devil's done with somebody, he's done with them. And then they just merrily go off. So the idea here is we have, God has given us spiritual weapons that we can use against spiritual beings that help us overcome them. Very simply. No drama, no paranoid, no flash, no, no uh, you know, all this uh, fear and excitement. It's the power of God that's available to every believer. And that's the first source we ought to be looking at. Several years ago, uh, Ashley was young, just a little child. I don't know if she's seven or eight, but there was some abnormal behavior that was taking place, and it went on for a couple of days. My wife and I said, what's going on? This, ain't, this is not normal. Uh, this is outside of the normal. And so we just kind of went in a room and trying to check some of the toys or some of the things, anything in here that might be a magnet. We found a little necklace with a Tasmanian devil on it. It was a gift given to her by somebody at Rensselaer Church. And we found something else. There's something else with a Tasmanian devil, something else a little demonic like that we found. Devil? What do I got a devil in my house for? <laughs> And so we just threw it out, prayed over the house, prayed over her, and everything was back to her normal cantankerous. No. <laughs> her, her, he, back to return. When your children, little kids, have horrible dreams at night, do we consider the spiritual aspect? You say, are you saying that devils don't play fair? They do not play fair. They go for the weakest link in the house. And so we need to cover them with the shed blood of Christ, and those dreams will go away. Okay, sometimes these things are open up. You can walk through Walmart, you know, during Halloween and see all this, yeah, and there's maybe a devil's hanging around there getting a jolly out of that. Yeah, it can be that quick. These spirits are, it can go from one system to this, and it can be so quick. I mean, Simon Peter spoke by the inspiration of God, and minutes later spoke by the inspiration of Satan. That quick. And that's how it can happen if a person is not alert to it. If you would look in 2 Kings chapter 6. <coughs> now, devils like dead bodies. Remember the maniac of Gadara? Where did he spend his time? 
in sepulchers and assemblies. They like dead things. Okay, and so when you have dead things that are openly in society, skeletons, you know, it's Halloween, you know, all this gory stuff going on. Second Kings chapter 6, so since devils like dead things, that means they're involved in war. On D-Day, on Normandy, if God opened the eyes of the soldiers that made it through, they would have seen devils hovering over those dead carcasses, reveling in that, enjoying that, like the ravens after the flood where they didn't come back because they were eating on the dead carcasses. Do people see that? No, they don't see that. There have been some military records where they do say angels showed up or UFOs showed up and kidnapped some people, but that's never talked about because people don't want to talk about the paranormal. I mean, it's out there. In 2 Kings chapter 6, the king of Syria is wanting to fight, have a battle with Israel. So they are having battle plans. This is highly confidential information. This is classified, classified information. 2 Kings 6 verse 8, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such place shall be my camp. Okay, so the idea, the battle plans were, we're going to camp here, and when we call Israel battle, they're going, to have to, they're going to have to come this way, and we'll catch them off guard. That was the plan. Verse 9, and the man of God, this happens to be Elisha, sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. Now, under the Old Testament covenant, the prophets, by God, had a direct communication. They had a direct line. And this, they, uh, a little birdie told them this. And he had a direct communication with the king of Israel because they're a very small nation. Okay, and he said, okay, they're going to be holed up here. You're heading over here. Uh, I would suggest you go a different route to get over here. And that's what he did. He wisely followed Elisha's counsel. Verse 11, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for his, this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? So he's back in his battle plan. He's going, who's spy? Who leaked it? Who le it's federal crime. Who leaked it? You know, unless it's the media, of course, it's not a crime. Okay, so he's trying to figure out where the leak is. And one of them somehow figured it out. One of the servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. He had a direct line. His house was bugged. And the bug was the spirit of God. So a little birdie told him the spirit of God. The dove came in and told him what's going on. So this king is going to get rid of Elisha, forgetting that Elisha knows he's going to try to get rid of him. Verse 13, and he said, go and spy where he is that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, behold, he's in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. Okay. And that morning, people woke up and saw they were surrounded by an army, horses and chariots. No doubt, paranoia set in, drama, people panicked. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Ah, that's good. That's a normal response. Paranoid, drama. Ah, I'm going, we're losing it. We're dead. So he's running around like crazy, and Elisha's sitting there watching and said, Boy, that was a pretty good flip you just did. Boy, I really, uh, hey, you, you, you do a good job. And Elisha says, uh, Fear not. And he, in his mind, said, What are you, nuts? He said, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. He said, have you checked the census lately? Do you know this, how many city people are in this city? Elisha's talking spiritual. 17, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee open his eyes that he may see. 
And the Lord opened the eyes of a young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. Behind every Syrian soldier was a grim reaper with a sigh, getting ready to, and he saw it. Oh, wow. Give the charge. You see, that's considering the spirit world. You see, where these, this, the dark world, they don't consider the spirit world, and we don't consider the spirit world, and hence we become paranoid. Relax. God's got, he's, he's not saying, God in heaven is not saying, oh, there's a hurricane in Florida. I just don't know what to do. No problem. No problem with him, not at all. Okay, and so we need to realize that the power of our God is amazing. He's got things in order. He's got a plan. He's got a system. He's working it out. He's getting his chess pieces in order, getting everything in order. And the devil thinks that he's getting away with stuff. He ain't getting away with anything. It's not a struggle. It's no more for a struggle for a guy to put a worm on a hook, throw it out, and a fish grabs it, and you just reel him in. Because that's what Leviathan is described in Job chapter 41. Faith in God is our first weapon. Faith in God. When people get paranoid, they have forgotten God. They forgot about Him. And so we need to get back to it. Don't forget God. And then we get to our weapons that we have available to us. In Luke chapter 11, you and I have a prayer of binding that we can bind. Okay? Somebody in an office uh, that's given a real, being a real pain to you, how about this? Try going into another room, quietly pray out loud, but quietly. So, I mean, the devil's got good hearing. They can hear it. They really can hear through walls and everything. Just bind the unclean spirit that that party probably... I'm not saying cast it out. I say bind it. Settle it down. Shut it up. I wouldn't advise casting it out because if that's a lost man, he's going to go get a couple buddies and then it's going to, then all hell is going to break loose. Okay, it's not drama. It's not paranoid. It's just very quietly, matter-of-factly. Luke chapter 11, verse 20 this is where the Lord, you read the context, it's talking about unclean spirits. You can see this is where the Lord mentions the finger of God, where he just flicks them off. Got a skeeter on you? Just, and then flick it off. Because mosquitoes is what the Bible uses to portray unclean spirits. Flies, mosquitoes, buzzards, raven, owls, unclean animals, unclean birds, unclean flying things. Leeches, okay, things like that. Another thing we need to do, second, you can bind the evil forces in prayer. So, third thing is you need to personally resist it. You personally resist it. It is our obligation to stand against it. In Ephesians, it says stand against it. <clears throat> in James, it says resist the devil and he will flee from you. In 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against God. So if you get this imaginary thought, this evil surmising that you have about someone or something, throw it away, cast it down. Because Philippians 4, verse 8 says, tells us what we are to think on. He tells us we are to control our thought life. We are to think about things. And I know we all fail at it. <clears throat> I know that we all can be overcome by things and we can panic and have drama and all this stuff. I, I understand all that stuff. We've all failed. But the thing is that the Lord has given us some marvelous spiritual weapons that we can be a conquering soldier for Jesus Christ. Exalt the name of Jesus Christ in his blood, the fourth thing. If you would, in Acts 19, you can look at it if you want. Acts 19, 13 is the very first time the word exorcist is the only time the word exorcist is found in the Bible. And the uh, people in Hollywood that made the Exorcist movie got this from the Bible. Okay, and you'll see in there that the name of Jesus Christ is mentioned. Now, there it says, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And then everything went belly up after that. So my, my idea, or the Bible idea is, don't limit it to the name Jesus. 
or Christ. Why? Second Corinthians says there's another Jesus, and Matthew 24 says there are many Christ. You got to use the whole name, the Lord Jesus Christ, so there is no confusion. Okay, there is power in that name. Okay, and when that name is mentioned, you might see circuit breakers go off. On the street, you know, dealing with people, I'll watch their eyes and I'll mention the Lord Jesus Christ and I'll watch their eyes will start kind of popping and doing something. Okay, and you watch their eyes or they glaze over. I've seen their eyes glaze over in less than a second by a certain word. Or a certain idea that that devil doesn't like. And all of a sudden, boom, they blinded. They're blinded right on the spot. They're deaf. You can talk to them from here on out. And nothing's going to happen. you got to break through that spiritual barrier somehow, some way. And you exalt the name of Jesus Christ and his shed blood. His shed blood is still available. Re- Revelation 12, verse 11. They overcame the Antichrist by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. These are not... Mystical things are not paranoid things. They're not, uh, you know, it's just that the Christian world doesn't know anything about it. And it's just a matter of fact thing that's a great power. As parents, you need to know these things for your children. Grandparents, we need to be praying for our kids. And glory to God, there is no limitation on distance. And his air force goes around the world, all over the place. And it's an amazing thing. And the last thing is we need to master the sword of the Spirit. Okay? We need to master this book because the devil knows that book better than any of us. And if he quoted or misquoted that book to Jesus Christ, most of Satan's activity occurs when somebody twists a word or word of the Bible. This is why we have so many denominations is because a devil twist this verse, Acts 2.38. They'll twist this verse, Matthew 7, verse 1. These people think they're obeying the Bible and they're obeying the devil. Why? Because they don't know the Bible. Well, the Bible says you're not supposed to judge. Oh, it also says you are supposed to judge. Which one's right? The one he says don't judge is to a hypocrite. So if you want to apply that, apply it. But he that's spiritual judgeth all things in 1 Corinthians 2. And so these people don't know their Bible. Hence, they don't know how to counter it. And so what did Jesus Christ do when he was tempted? It is written. It is written. It is written. He quoted it. He quoted scripture. And if we don't spend time in this book, how are we going to know what to quote? And this is why the new Bibles are so powerful. Gail Ripplinger, before she wrote uh, the book she wrote on the King James Bible, New Age Bible version, she was a teacher at Kent State University. She was a known Christian. Many of the Christian young people would come to her for devotions. And she observed that the kids that had a King James Bible and they believed it were more stable in their Christian walk than the kids with the NIV. The ones with the NIV, they would be like this. Drama, down, up and down. And that's why the devil is in the Bible-making business, knowing that is his way to overcome. And that's why we have to get in that book. A person cannot ignore that book and think that they're going to be a powerful Christian. They're not going to be. And that's why I brag about that book so much. That's why we got to get in it. And we get in that book and we discover that that book is a sword of the spirit and that's what we can be in a knife fight and be cutting up them spirits. We don't see it, but man, we are cutting them spirits up like crazy just by quote, well, I don't believe what you just said. Well, you don't have to. The spirit inside you does. Okay? And you're working on them. You're wrestling against flesh and blood. Or not against flesh and blood. You're wrestling against principalities and powers and the uh, friends in high places, that's what we're wrestling against. And if we don't get in a spiritual battle, man, we are, our goose is cooked. You see, but again, it's not paranoid. We're not under a spirit of fear. 
It's not drama. It's just very matter of fact. It's just following the power of God Almighty. Oh, a tremendous God. And he's given us those abilities or opportunities that we could stand and be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us, each and every one of us, to be more than conquerors. More than conquerors through Christ. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I pray you'd help us to be discerning people that we can recognize that flesh and blood is not our enemy. There's something else going on. And Lord, I pray you'd help us recognize that we can be faithful to you, good soldiers of Christ, prepared, meet for the master's use, so that we might just fulfill your bidding and recognize, yeah, there's things going on, but we rest in your power, the power of God, the blood of Christ, the name of Jesus Christ, the sword of the Spirit. And Lord, I just pray you'd help us be uh, faithful soldiers in that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, we'll be dismissed with that.